Alrighty, so we're reading from John 4, 1 to 26. Now Jesus learnt that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptising more disciples than John, although in fact it was not Jesus who baptised, but his disciples. So he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria, so he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, I have nothing to, You have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, and did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and I won't have to keep coming back here to draw water. He told her, Go and call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, You were right when you say you have no husband. Fact is, you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, and you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know, We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshippers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshippers must worship him in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that the Messiah, called Christ, is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. I'll pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity we have now to reflect on what your word says. We thank you for the power that is in your word. Uh, We thank you for the spirit that dwells within us as we hear your word read. And we pray this morning that we might respond to your word in faith and obedience. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, What quenches uh, your thirst? Uh, So when I first arrived in Australia, one of the greatest ads I'd ever seen was the VB ad. Uh, You got it, you know, know, I have it now. You can get it through, what, sliding, uh, through skiing, through chopping, through whatever activity you're doing. Uh, A matter of fact, I've got it now, that that lovely voice. And what is it? Uh, What quenches the greatest thirst is nothing quite like a Victoria Bitter. Yeah? Yeah, go. Anyway, um, I see they've changed their style of ads now. They don't do the kind of drinking beer now. Now they've got men's aftershave and soap wash and that you can put in the bath with you for our new kind of man, our metro men. Oh, sorry, I wasn't pointing at you, Mitch. I was pointing beyond you. Um, <laughs> Anyway, I'm not sure. Let's just go back to the beer ads, right? What quenches your thirst, Victoria Bitter? Really? Does it? Mm. In the 1970s, back in South Africa, we had an ad that used to run that even claimed beyond quenching your thirst, it actually added life. If you wanted to live the good life, the full life, the extended life, there was one drink you could drink that not only quenched your thirst, but added life. What was it? Sorry? Coca-Cola, that's right. (laughs) Coke adds life. Fantastic, right? 
Um, <clears throat> anyway, I don't know how you go with that. What does quench our human thirst? I'm no doctor, but I understand that the large part of our body is made up of liquid and water. Uh, I want, don't want to give the percentage just in case someone points out that I'm wrong. Uh, anyway, but apparently uh, we have lots of liquid and water in our system, and when we, our body's depleted of that or it's lower than it should be, we get a thirst, and the only way to quench that thirst is what? Is to drink water, right? Because that's how our body is made. We are uh, made with water, liquid, and we need to replenish that time and time again, and the only way you can replenish that is through drinking water. And then the athletes will say, nah, you can do the power aid thing and all that. So let's just stay with me, okay? Stay with the program. Anyway, so that's the idea. It's ultimately water that quenches your thirst because that's what your body is made up of primarily. Water quenches your thirst. Not VB, not Coca-Cola, not any other liquid form, but water. Because that's how you've been made. Let me expand the metaphor slightly with you. What are you thirsting for in life? Are you thirsting for meaning? Are you thirsting for purpose? Are you thirsting for true love? What is it you're thirsting for? And what do you believe will quench that thirst? Is it a successful career? Is it great wealth? Is it human relationships? Is it happiness, fun in the sun all day long? What is it? What are you pursuing with all your heart and your mind? What are you using with all of your heart and your mind that you believe ultimately will quench your thirst in this life. Here is Jesus, and he's thirsty. Jesus has been in Judea. Uh, he's reading the crowd. He's reading the political scene. He's reading the religious scene. And he can work out that people are not happy with him. Why? Because Jesus is getting a greater following every single day. More and more people are coming to Jesus, following Jesus, being baptized, not by Jesus, but by his disciples, even more than John's disciples. And the religious leaders of the day and the political leaders of the day find this absolutely concerning. And so Jesus kind of reads the room and he says to his disciples, it's time to go. Let's go back to Galilee. And he hits the road and goes on this journey to Galilee. And while he's walking, he gets to uh, uh, Saqqara, um, which is around about in Samaria. And he's, he's, he's done. He's tired. He's exhausted. He needs a rest. He sends his disciples back into the town to go and get some food. He can't go any further. He sits down by Jacob's well and he's resting and he needs a drink of water. Whoa, pause. What is your impression or your understanding of a God? What are gods like? Never get tired, right? So on Friday I watched a movie, sorry. I watched Thor, the new one, right? Uh, the God of Thunder. And there is Russell Crowe as Zeus, fat Greek boy, that's what he is. And it was just interesting to watch this movie about these gods and your impression of gods and what gods are like. And I'll make reference to that a little bit later. But Jesus is nothing like that. Do you notice it? He is God who's come to earth to dwell among us to be like us, to have the same kind of concerns, same kind of struggles, the same kind of temptations as you and me. 
He's in the muck with us. There he is. He's not flying. He possibly could. He probably could. He could. He can walk on water. He could fly from Judea to wherever he's going. But here is Jesus walking and getting tired and turning up at a well and he needs to rest and he's thirsty and needs a drink. Who is this man? Who is this man that's come to live among us? To come experience life just like us? It's phenomenal, isn't it? Don't glean over it. That this is the God of creation. The only true God who comes to earth to live among us. You see in this story how the tension of the author of John trying to help you understand who this Jesus is. Gets to the well and at midday a Samaritan woman comes and he asks a Samaritan woman for a drink of water. And at that point Jesus is kind of overreaching. <laughs> He's breaking the barriers that are there. He's breaking the gender barrier. He's a man speaking to a woman, which was a weird thing in the first century, to speak to a woman privately like that. He's breaking the cultural barrier. Here is a Jewish man speaking to a Samaritan woman, unheard of. But more than that, you notice as you read the story, that here is the man that's breaking the social barrier and the moral barrier. He knows who this woman is. He knows everything about her. And he should not associate with her in any way, shape or form. Why? Because nobody in our own community associates with her. She has to come down to the well in the middle of the day that's not when the women come down to the well. The women come down in group in numbers because there's safety in group and numbers and they come down early morning or they come down late afternoon. They certainly don't come down to the well in the middle of the day. This woman is a social outcast. And then you discover why. Because of her moral behavior. Jesus says to the woman, go and fetch your husband. She says, I don't have a husband. And Jesus says, of course you don't have a husband. You've had five. And the man you're with now is not your husband. You see what's going on? The gods of Thor shouldn't behave that way. They should have nothing to do with mortal, sinful, wicked people. Right? But not this Jesus. Jesus breaks every single barrier to offer this woman a gift. The most amazing gift that could ever be offered. This social outcast. This woman who is a moral failure. This woman who is a, comes from the wrong side of the fence. This woman, who's a woman in the first century. Who is this man? Who is this man that will come and walk among us? Who is this man who will live a life and thirst and hunger? Who is this man that will be able to see right into who you are and who I am and see our brokenness and our despair and our wickedness and endeavor to have a conversation with us? Who is this man? She says to him, Ah, I know you're a prophet because you've told me about my own life. And you see how smart she is? She now changes the conversation. She's like, let's not talk about me anymore. 
let's talk about the big ideas in life. Let's talk about religion. You know, you Jews say the place to worship God is in Jerusalem at the temple. We Samaritans believe you should worship God where we have created this place. Remember, this place is the place of the promise. That is, one of our great ancestors, Jacob, was here. He, he dug his well here. He gave it to his son. And she's reminding him of the historical significance of the Samaritans and Jacob. He is one of the great forefathers of the promise. Whenever you re make reference in the Old Testament to the promises of God, the promises of land, blessing, descendants, and the blessing to the nations is always repeated through the forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so, yes, she is quite clever. She says, let's not talk about me. Let's talk about where's the right place to worship God. In Jerusalem or on this mountain in Samaria. And Jesus says to her, right now, the place to worship God is at the temple. The place to worship God is at the temple for that's where the sacrifices are made. For that's what God has established. But then he says to her, time is coming. And the English doesn't do justice. It actually is the hour is here. And whenever John records the time is coming, the hour is here, he is speaking about an event in the life of Jesus. An event of Jesus' death, resurrection. And Jesus says, there's a time coming, the hour is now, where people will not worship God in the temple or on that mountain. For what God desires is true worshippers. What God desires is that people worship him in spirit and in truth. And he says, there is a time coming, the hour is now where true worshippers will worship God in spirit and in truth. She says to him, oh, this is very good. I know you're a good teacher. When the Messiah comes, when the one who has promised to us comes, he will make this all clear to us. And what does Jesus say? I, the one speaking to you, I am he. Who is this man? Who is this man that will come and live among us? Who will experience all the difficulties, struggles of life like us? Who will engage you not judge you, who will show you, who will know everything about you and yet won't reject you. Who is this man? Who is this man that will offer you a gift that you do not deserve? What is the gift that Jesus offers? He offers to quench your thirst. Did you see that? That's what he offers the woman. He says, if you knew who you were talking to, you would ask me for living water, and I would give you that living water, and that living water will swell up to eternal life, and you will never thirst again. What's the woman thirsting for? Five husbands and the man that you are now with is not your husband? Love. 
relationship, sense of belonging. Is she that immoral? Isn't that what you and I all long for? Love, relationship, belonging. Jesus says to her, if you knew who you were talking to, you would ask him and he would give you water that springs up to eternal life that will quench your deepest fear, uh, your deepest desire. What is it about the Spirit? <laughs> what is it about the Spirit of God? If you haven't worked it out yet, let me tell you what you were made for. Let me tell you what you're thirsting after. You are thirsting after a, 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 a relationship with God. For that's why you were made. Woman, man, children, all of humanity was made for a relationship with God. That's what you yearn for. Whether you believe it or not. And you can chase after everything else in this world. But it will not satisfy you. Because you were made to be in a relationship with God. And the only way to have your relationship with God restored, renewed, continued is if you have God come and live inside you. The Jesus that walked among us, the Jesus that showed compassion and kindness to us, that Jesus says, I have come to die on a cross, rise after three days, and then I'm going back to the Father, but I will not leave you alone. I will give you my spirit and my spirit will well up in you to eternal life and God will be with you and he will never leave you and he will never forsake you in the good times, in the bad times, all through life and into eternity. What are you thirsting for? Would you like Jesus to quench your thirst? Just receive his gift. And his gift is the Holy Spirit. Where God will dwell in you and be with you. That's a fantastic segue to a baptism, don't you think? I'm going to pray. We're going to stand and sing. And then we're going to uh, baptize young Jake. Pray to God that he would put his spirit upon him and abide with him for the rest of his days. Let me pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, you know us. You know our desires, our wants, our needs. You know how, we've, how we live. You know everything about us. And yet despite that, you would send your son to come and live among us. You would send your son to give his life as a ransom for us. And you would offer as a gift, not earned or deserved, you would offer as a gift your Holy Spirit to live in us, to abide with us, to transform us, to make us more like Jesus, to enrich us and fulfill us beyond this life into eternity. What a glorious God you are. 
you are so worthy of our praise. We thank you for your kindness and mercy. We thank you for your abiding presence. We thank you for the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank you in his name. Amen.